Welcome, this is a recorded session of the Post-Quantum Cryptography Conference of the PKI Consortium. This conference would not have been possible without our sponsors in Trust, HID Global, and PQ Shield, and the organizational support of the Post-Quantum Cryptography Working Group of the PKI Consortium, in particular in Trust, Logius, TNO, and CWI. We would like to introduce our next speakers. Um, which are Bill Newhaus and Dustin Moody from NIST, um, which are going to talk about the current state um, of PQC standardization and activities. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Paul and Albert. It's a pleasure to be here this morning to give a little update from NIST. I'm Dustin Moody. This is my colleague, Bill Newhouse from the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence. Um, yeah, so we'll just give a little update. Uh, most of you are probably pretty familiar with a lot of the, the stuff going on that we've been doing with our, our post-quantum project. So of course the main reason um, that we're all worried about this is we've known for a few decades that there are some quantum algorithms that if you have a big enough quantum computer, they would be able to run these algorithms. So one of them was discovered by Peter Shore. And it would be able to factor large integers. It would also be able to do something called solve the discrete log problem. And it turns out, uh, pretty much all the public key crypto systems that we use today are reliant on, on those problems for their security. Another more general algorithm is Grover's algorithm. And it would also, not just the, the public key ones. So those are the kind of the two main algorithms that keep cryptographers up late at night. There are other quantum algorithms or other variants and speed ups, but uh, these are kind of the, the main ones that people thought about first. At NIST, we have a variety of cryptographic standards to do all sorts of things. We've got public key standards, we've got symmetric key, we've got hash functions, random number generation, uh, key management, and we have a lot of standards that have been developed for the, the United States federal government. The quantum thread is most directly applied to our public key crypto standards. Uh, those are housed in a couple different documents. FIPS 186.5 has digital signatures, and then SP 856A and B have our key establishment algorithm. So those are the ones that when we looked at this a number of years back, we said these are the ones that have to be completely revamped. We can't just switch to larger parameters. We have to come up with completely new algorithms. So the focus of, of our efforts has been to get new algorithms to replace the ones in these standards right here. Now, the symmetric key ones and, and the hash functions and some of these other ones as well, they're going to be impacted as well due to Grover's algorithm, but we can manage that, that change a little easier. At worst, if you're using AS128, we think you should still be fine for a long time, but if you need to go up to AS256, that's just using a longer key. That's, that's much more manageable than having to completely use a different algorithm. So we've known about this since the 1990s. Um, it was mostly just a theoretical, you know, something interesting. Quantum computers were being researched and, and built, but they were too small to, to be of any, any worry. Um, so how soon do we need to worry? Um, there's going to be a talk later on kind of how big of a quantum computer do you need to break, you know, cryptography at current security levels. Uh, there's a couple of things, though, that let us know that we need to worry about this problem today and not just put it off into the future, you know, 10, 20 years. Um, there's a, Dr. McKelly Most, who's one of the experts in the field, he's done a lot of good work. Um, on the right, he has this kind of theorem that he's used for a while that it's kind of the idea behind Harvest Now Decrypt Later. Uh, it says if, if you need to protect your information for X years and it's going to take Y years to transition, if that is greater than the Z years until we have a quantum computer, you're going to be vulnerable to this Harvest Now Decrypt Later and information that you want protected for a long period of time you know, your adversary might, might be recording it, and then they'll get access to it once they get a quantum computer. So if you put in numbers for like what X, Y, and Z could be for your organization, that helps you know that, yeah, you could actually be at risk today, even though a quantum computer isn't 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, however long it is, in the future. Um, in this, where we deal with the, the standards, we know that creating the standards and migrating to them also is going to take a really, really long time. 
one of the takeaways on the previous slides that this is going to be the, the hardest crypto transition we've ever done, and that's completely true. So that's another reason why we have to, to work on this well in advance of the quantum computer. Uh, the graph on the left, that's also from a, a group that Dr. Mosca is affiliated with, the Quantum Risk, Risk Institute. And every year or two, they put out a survey where they, they write to a number of experts and they ask them, when do you think we're going to have a big enough quantum computer that will crack current levels of RSA, like RSA 2048, in 24 hours? And then they collect the results and they put it all in a nice report. This chart's kind of a, from the front, it summarizes it. Mostly it just shows experts think around 15 to 20 years there's a, a non-zero chance. It could be a little sooner, it could be a little later. But that gives you some idea of kind of the timeline of the expert's opinion in this survey for when we uh, might have a, what's called a cryptographically relevant quantum computer. The United States government is starting to, to take concrete steps and actions um, to prepare for this. Uh, Bill's going to talk about this in a little bit, some more detailed steps the federal government is doing. But we've had some national security memos come out from the White House. We've had Congress has passed legislation. The National Security Agency has also updated some of their guidance relative to quantum-resistant cryptography. The main kind of goal is in this quote on the, the bottom left that says the, the federal government in the U.S. is hoping to transition as much as they can by 2035 their high-priority systems. So that's just in 12 years from now. Uh, it's a very ambitious goal. I'm sure we won't be completely migrated, but it's, it's a good goal to set. <laughs> So let's tell you a little bit more about uh, the standardization efforts that we do. Um, that's mostly what I focus on. I lead our, I'm in the crypto technology group at NIST, and we're the ones that write the standards. And we've been uh, thinking about post-quantum for a long time, but it was back in 2016 that we decided that we needed to kind of take some steps that would actually get us to a standard, kind of set off on that path, and not just think about it. In the past, NIST has run some cryptographic competitions. We did this to, to develop the algorithm AES as a, as a standard. And more recently, we had the SHA-3 competition to get a new hash function. We decided to leverage this, this method of getting strong algorithms for standards with our post-quantum cryptography you know, competition. In some ways, it would be different than past, past competitions. We knew that there would be more than one algorithm that we select. We knew it would be way more complicated. Um, we knew that this was an ongoing research field, so there might need to be changes made throughout the process. But our goal was to run an open and a transparent process that we could bring the community together. We could get a lot of algorithms to evaluate. And together, we come to consensus on which of these are the strongest ones, and then we could standardize them. We knew there wasn't going to be a silver bullet that would be able to just be a perfect drop-in replacement and beat our current crypto systems in every, you know, in, in every metric. We knew that wasn't going to be the case. The selection criteria that we used, uh, we announced this back at the beginning, and we've used this whenever we've needed to uh, make decisions. First and foremost is security. Any algorithm needs to be secured against both classical and quantum computers. Throughout the process, we've seen classical attacks are often the ones that have broken some of the algorithms uh, without even having to worry about quantum. <laughs> Security is measured in a variety of different ways. There's looking at the best known attacks. There's looking at the asymptotic complexity. Um, there's looking at security proofs, um, kind of all these different ways. Uh, we define five security categories as a way to kind of uh, measure concretely and relate it back to existing standardized algorithm so for example, uh, if submitters put in a parameter set at category 1, that meant to break those parameters, it should be about as hard as to break AES-128 using the same amount of or similar uh, resources. So we define categories 1 through 5. We think categories 1, 2, and 3 should be enough for several decades. But we have uh, all the way up to category 5 um, for applications which need a lot of security. Second criteria is performance. Obviously, uh, that's very important. That's looking at key sizes, ciphertext, signature sizes, looking at the memory, the bandwidth, um, how many clock cycles does it take to, to run this in hardware and software and everything like that. 
So there's a, there's a whole lot of benchmarking that goes on and, and ways to compare this. And then there's a, a lot of other criteria that it would be nice to have as many of these things as possible. Are they resistant to side channels? Are they easy to analyze? Um, so on and, and so forth. We had three rounds of evaluation. Um, we, we announced this call. We received 82 submissions, 69 of them met the criteria, and we posted their specs online, including their code, the algorithm descriptions, and then we had three different rounds of evaluation. So in the first round, uh, a lot of these algorithms were very quickly attacked or broken, probably like uh, 15 to 20 of them. There, there was workshops going on, there was research being presented, you know, um, benchmarking starting to be done. And after the end of the first round, we picked a smaller number to move on into the second round. This included kind of the best crypto systems from each of the different ideas that are currently uh, being looked at, like lattices and codes and, and isogenies, hash-based cryptography, multivariate. In the second round, we had 26 algorithms. Um, and then again, similarly, a lot of evaluation done. Some of them were attacked. Uh, some of them uh, were broken. Research presented, conferences. Uh, at the end of the second round, we again wrote a report, made some selections, and had seven finalists and eight alternates that we were looking at in the third round. The third round lasted about two years, and finally, in the, the summer of 2022, we were happy to, to reach that milestone where we announced the algorithms that we would be standardizing. And hopefully, you've all uh, heard of these algorithms already. We selected one chem, Crystal's Kyber, and then three digital signature algorithms as the first algorithms that we'd be standardizing for uh, protection against these quantum attacks. Uh, we have a, a nice report, Mr. 8413, that if you want more of the details, why did we choose Kyber and not Saber or Entry, you know, you can, you can go to that report, you can see the, the reasons for the selections there. Uh, we also said we're not quite done with the process, we only picked one chem. So we, we still have four other chems that we moved on into a fourth round of analysis that we were going to take a little bit more time and, and pick some of them for standardization as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But And we also said uh, even though we selected three digital signatures, we were going to, to do a smaller call for additional di digital signatures. And I'll explain why uh, in a second. So the algorithms we selected, Crystal's Kyber, uh, <coughs> Also, crystals, dilithium, and falcon. All three of those are based on lattice-based cryptography, or structured lattices to bring their key sizes uh, down a little bit. The lattice-based algorithms throughout the process tended to have very good all-around performance, very good security, and they were the most promising um, family of algorithms, and that shows in the selection that we did. We think Kyber and Dilithium should be the main two algorithms that people use for their various applications. So those, those are probably the, the two for, for key exchange and for signatures. We also selected Falcon, however. Um, Falcon has smaller signatures than Dilithium. So for some applications, you really need the small signatures. Falcon's available. It has a much, much more complex implementation. And so when you're implementing that, there's a lot of devices where you're not going to be able to do that easily, so you'll, you'll stick with dilithium there, but you have kind of options. Sphinx Plus is a more conservative, based on stationary hash-based cryptography, so uh, we selected it. However, its performance is not nearly as good as the lattice algorithms, so it, it's bigger, it's slower. Uh, some applications, if performance is in the top constraint, well then that's a, that could be a, a good choice for you. This shows uh, our timeline of where we've been and where we're going. Uh, we're going to hold a, our fifth standardization conference next April. It'll be in Rockville, Maryland, just outside of NIST. It'll be an in-person uh, workshop there. So everyone here is invited to go to there. We hope to see you there. Uh, there's, a, there's a call for papers and presentations that's already out. So if you want to speak or present, you can uh, send that on to us. Uh, very important, we, we put out draft standards for Kyber and Dilithium and uh, Sphinx Plus. Those have been out since August. Uh, the deadline for public comments on them is you've got another two weeks or so. 
Um, so if you haven't read them, please take a look. And uh, we need public comments back by November 22nd. <coughs> our goal with our timeline is that we want these standards to be done, the first ones, in the first half of 2024. So we know everyone's waiting for this, and that's when we're expecting uh, to, to get these things out, out the door. So a little bit more detail on the standards. Uh, these will be written up in this jargon. Uh, they're, they're called Federal Information Processing Standards, FIPS. Each algorithm is going to appear in its own separate FIPS. Kyber is going to be in FIPS 203, and we're going to call it MLCHEM. We always, we the government have to give it you know, new names, new acronyms. Uh, Dilithium is in FIPS 204, it's MLDSA. Sphinx Plus is in FIPS 205, and it's SLHDSA. Falcon, we selected it, we're currently writing it, but we got the first three done first, and Falcon will probably take another, I don't know, nine months-ish or so until we have a draft standard for it published, so it, it's being worked on. We'll also update some of our other NIST standards and guidance and documentation. Uh, we're going to publish a special publication talking about key establishment mechanisms, things you need to know about them. Um, so we'll have a lot of other updates and revisions going along to some of our other documents as well. So these standards, uh, they do, we had to choose specific parameter sets, talk about which specific you know, hash functions are going to be involved, and make some concrete choices. So the round three specs specified most things, but as we went through the standards, we had to you know, further get into the weeds and sort out some details. We've had discussion on the PPC forum. We don't expect a lot of changes from the round three specs, and you can see that in the in the draft standards that we published in August. Um, the final version should be pretty close to the, the draft versions as well. Uh, we welcome all feedback on this. We have a, a PQC forum that's established. You can have a discussion there. You can also email us directly. If you want to provide comments on the, the draft FIPS, there's special email addresses to, to send comments kind of directly there. So the fourth round I mentioned, that's ongoing. We have uh, four different algorithms there that are in the process. Three of them are based on codes. Um, so in probably six months to a year, we'll, we'll wrap up the fourth round, and we'll select one or two of these algorithms for standardization as well to complement Crystal's Kyber. So being based on codes, you know, if, if there's some new advance in lattices, we have a different security primitive the base are another chem on. Um, I will note Psych was on there. It's been broken. Um, hopefully you've heard about that. The Psych submitter acknowledge it. So even though it's still technically in the fourth round, uh, it's not going to be selected for standardization if anyone was, was wondering about that. Uh, also on going, we have a what we call the on-ramp, the additional signature process. Uh, we have three digital signatures selected. Um, what we're targeting in this is Sphinx Plus is not lattice-based, but its performance is not so great. So the main motivation was to find an algorithm not based on lattices, but that it has better performance than Sphinx Plus and can be used for more applications. We put out a call. Uh, just over the last summer, we posted the 40 submissions that met the requirements. Those are currently being evaluated. So if you're interested in that, all the code, all their specifications are up on our website. Uh, tomorrow I'll give it give a, another talk that goes into a little bit more detail on uh, the on ramp. We do have some standards for stateful hash based cryptography that currently are already done and can be used. Uh, stateful hash based cryptography has been around for a long time. It was first standardized in the INTF, and then we came up with some similar standards to standardize uh, XMSS and LMS. A caution that while these are ready to go and can be used. These are not general purpose digital signature algorithms because you have to manage the state. There's some pitfalls you have to be very, very careful to avoid or you completely lose all security. So uh, you have to be careful with that. Um, the NSA has what's called a CS CNSA 2.0 for national security systems and they point to these algorithms that you can use for, for signing software and firmware updates. So that's got a lot of interest recently um, in that. Some challenges there we're working on resolving with industry. So there's a lot of other organizations that are working on, uh, you know, standardization and migration. Uh, this is very grateful that we've, we've collaborated and cooperated with a lot of these groups, and uh, we're continuing to do so. 
Uh, we'll hear a lot of the various countries today, their standardization effort. Um, we talk with them, we communicate with them. Uh, so it's nice that we're not fracturing all our efforts. We're, we're very much working together on this. Uh, there's going to be a lot of talk about the transition and the migration. Um, the project builds leading focuses on that, so I'm not going to say too much. Um, there's a lot of interest in things like hybrid, where you're combining classical and post-quantum. This does already have one of our, our standards that shows how you can uh, do a hybrid key establishment. You can combine two keys and still get FIPS validation. The FIPS validation only applies to the you know, existing standardized algorithm. Um, this isn't going to require uh, or put hybrid into the standards. Uh, it's going to depend on the various applications and, and protocols to decide if it's right for them to use or not. Uh, yeah, we have the National Cybersecurity PPC Migration Project. Bill is going to talk about that. Um, and there's a lot of things that organizations can do. Uh, I don't think I'll spend too much time on this. There's a lot of good information. The project will talk a lot about this. There's a really nice fact sheet that NIST and CISA and the NSA put out that kind of summarizes it in a, just a one or two page document that describes a lot of these things. The main thing is don't wait. Um, well, we do want you to wait for the final standards. So you, you can test out the algorithms now, you can, you can get ready, wait for the final standards to begin actually you know, putting these into product. But for planning purposes, don't wait to think about your migration, start getting ready for, for that. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Bill. We've got a nice web page, we have a PPC forum, um, and this is very grateful for all the efforts in helping us on the algorithmic side, the standardization part. All right. Is my mic on yet? No? Yeah, there it is. Good. Hi, I'm Bill Newhouse. Thanks for, for, for Paul and Albert for inviting us to be here and for the sponsors for creating this opportunity. Some of the sponsors are part of what I'll be talking about next, which is a, a collaborative agreement uh, consortium of, of companies working with us at the Center of Excellence, uh, a name that came with the funding that created our place. It is an applied cybersecurity center for NIST to talk about cybersecurity and privacy and the things we can do to, to, to move people further along towards more secure, more, more private uh, computing. Uh, again, my name is Bill Newhouse. And at the center, we work on projects where we define a problem and assemble, build, and, and eventually uh, when we do the building, we create a functional system that is representative of something that we hope everybody would be willing to take on and do. And, and our focus is, to date has been on existing standards that aren't being fully adopted by industry. That model has changed in this project because the standard is developing while we're working a project to show what can we do now as we get in here. We have some tactics at the center where we can, we can create a lot of publications. So the magic number here, 1800, is a different number for special publications. And these are called practice guides because they are showing you what we've done in the lab environment that, that our collaborators join us in. But there's some cleverness we can do with white papers and this informational reports. Um, so those are just tactics we use with these buttons. So, so the bottom line of what I get to lead along with my colleague Marie, Maruja Sapaya is to bring collaborators together so that we can figure out what can we do to, to develop practices that will ease this migration. It's going to take a lot of effort. It's going to take a lot of work. You all know that because you're in this field and that's why you're here. And we need to come out and, and, and communicate this because it's not one place telling you how to do it. It's all of us figuring out how to do it together. And so, so this is why my project exists. And our timeline isn't as pretty in some respects because I can't figure out how to make this slide look perfect when I keep adding to the right. But um, this week, we, with after COVID, we finally had our first per in-person event of this co this collaboration. But note that we started talking about this project in 2021 and invited people to join us. And, and we had early adopters in joining. They, they knew about the center. They knew about coming to us to become a consortium member. We signed cooperative research and development agreements with the, each of those organizations. They're identical. So you're joining a consortium of people to bring your technologies and your skills with, with you. And so stuff happened. Um, these are the names of the collaborators. And the bad news is when I show you these names, you're going to say, why aren't I a collaborator? I want to be part of this too. And, and we have a process to bring you in. And the bad news is that's just a few more meetings and stuff. And we get to know you. The good news is we start to grow a community even bigger and try to manage it into you know, a project that you're like, what does the project do? The project creates something that we can show and document in these special pubs I talked about. Um, if you're in the room, you know, Graham was already up. So Graham is, is a collaborator. 
Uh, raise your hand. Uh, Volker, I saw you here from Budamaco. Uh, we have Jaime from Santander Bank, Grupo Santander. Anybody else recognize your company on this group? And, and have I not met you because we've only been doing this online and, and we did it, you know, without putting on our cameras and all those kinds of things. So apologies that you know, I can't recognize all of you, but I'm building a house. Nice to meet you guys. Teams has been good and WebEx and all that. So, so we've been bringing these people together. Uh, and what we've been doing together is Stuff like this, we, we need to support um, you know, what Dustin's arranging with you all as well. There has been government stuff, I have another session later to tell you about that, that's pushing us at NIST to do this. NIST is non-regulatory, a really cool place in, the, in our department, US Department of Commerce. People come work with us because we, we don't give out fines for anything you tell us that you know, isn't perfectly right yet in your, in your security. We talk about your challenges so that we can come up with standards and best practices at the center that help support its use and fixing your problems in a way that we've you know, got a foundation on that to help you. But you know, we, we, we all know here that adoption implementation and deployment is, is going to be, is, is not trivial, it's complex but doable and we're, we're trying to show you what is doable. And so we've been engaged in the community and right now my colleague Maruja is in Prague at the IETF hackathon because that's a, a tactic to, to get the standards engaged into the protocols that we use, like in X.509. And so we also have a, an outreach component for all of this, which is kind of obvious and necessary. So we have decided within our collaboration with these folks who have signed up to join us, we said, what's the best place to start? Well, this idea came from lots of other papers that were written before we started. The, the Canadian Forum for Digital Infrastructure Resilience, TNO, has a really good paper in this space about what do you need to do to become, you know, you want to say quantum safe, quantum ready, Quantum, you know, quantum invulnerable, don't use that one. But you know, there's lots of words we're also trying to figure out how to get in front of people so that the, your mental models of, of communication are expanded and, and easier. And so three areas we think you need to, to look into that we're, we're, we have technologies in our lab that, that can look inside your CI, CD pipeline. Um, and these are not our technologies, they're collaborative technologies. I should look down here, not there, but that's too small. My reading glasses aren't good enough, um, and I'm not wearing them. So uh, in networks and, and, and network traffic, what can you detect about the crypto you're using? And I'm just going to say cryptography. Sometimes we want to say cryptographic algorithm you're using. Those are all fancier words that mean something more to different technical levels of, of, of interest. But if you're a risk manager, you know, am I using cryptography that's, that's quantum safe, quantum resistance? Am I quantum ready yet? Uh, answers should still be no, but you're, you're getting there. And then in, in the places within your operating systems and in their certificate stores, all the things you rely on, can we look in those places? Let's get that information. Let's find out how these tools are communicating to the right in this picture, which is to the next device you have that will help you with risk analysis, that will help you correlate and understand what's going on. So this is a work stream. That means we've been trying to figure out what can we do in our lab and show people Many of the folks you're going to, if you're technology providers, you're walking into a room saying, I have a tool that can help you understand what cryptography you're using. They've never had one of those before. They've had one person who can sort of tell you, and they've had vendors who can tell you what's in their products, but this is going to be a bigger picture than they've ever seen. So figuring out how to take this data and, and use it to make prioritization decisions is interesting. Our project is only focused on what he's standardizing with you all. It is not focused on quantum random number generation. It is not, is not focused on quantum networking or quantum key distribution. It is focused on these algorithms and they're you know, putting them in place to do things that you're using uh, today's PKI for. Um, that's one work stream. Generously, I've offered you a publication here. This is a, a copy of the a pub that should be out by the 17th of November when I signed up with Albert and, and Paul to be here. I hoped it would have been out last week so that I could say, hey, come get this publication. It's out for public comment. I wanted to show you the table of contents just to give you a flavor of where we're looking and what we're talking about. So um, I'm hoping these slides are available to everybody so you, know, you can certainly take a picture of them. But this, this paper has a little bit of a foundation to explain why it's important. Um, and that's kind of redundant, because you know, Dustin just said it, I'll say it. But the threat, this group understands the threat, we, we spend some time talking about it, but then we dive into the tools and we're trying to normalize the language so that we can make this effective for everybody. So this, prop, this paper will be out in about a week, I hope, and we wish that you'll engage it and communicate your comments to us. Um, I'm not sure why, oh, the same one somewhere, yeah, sorry. Somehow I got two slides. The other work stream, is is uh, on this is the, the cool one where the, the people who have technologies are you know, selling to their customers 
they're coming to us and generously working to play with these protocols and, 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 and see what happens when you try the draft algorithms. So we have test results and, and this is what we're trying to do together to show, focus on interoperability and some performance measures, get it in front of people so that you can not have to do it yourself, understand some of the test methodologies we created, and we'll have results. This will be out next week as well, I hope. There's a U.S. shutdown of the government that's potentially going to get in our way. Table of contents for that, so you can see the spaces we're focusing on. Um, lots of good areas to look at. These work streams will not stop with these publications. They will grow because you will, you will comment on them and tell us what else we need to do to support the communities that you work in and you're trying to support. So again, hopefully you can pull these slides up later as, as, a, as a review and get a sense of, I want to come to this paper because I need to, I need to really hammer on X.509 or Quaker or TLS. Um, references, you can look these up. We have a, a, a website and everything. So uh, we, we're now open for questions. I don't know if you're, you know, definitely you're going to be tossed around a soft microphone, handing gently a soft microphone to people to ask Dustin questions. And then uh, you can ask me questions too, but ask Dustin questions. And thank you very much again for the opportunity to be in front of you guys today. And we look forward to your participation, continuing with us with the collaborators. If you want to be a collaborator, let me know this week. We'll talk about that. And thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Yes, thank you, thank you for this uh, this great presentation and the update. We will see. Uh, uh, Bill, back after the break, yep. uh, with a very interesting presentation on how the U.S. government is, is approaching all of this. Um, but do we have any questions um, for, for, for Dustin or for Bill uh, from the room? Let me time to toss this. Uh, <laughs> yes, that's risk management 101, <laughs> no. Uh, there's been some recent work on non-interactive key exchange. I'm going to start yeah, for, for Dustin. Um, or post-quantum uh, non-interactive exchange algorithms. Is NIST considering running a, a competition to replace Diffion? Well, it's an interesting question. So back when we made the call back in uh, 2016, um, you know, Diffion was what's used for key exchange. That's what we originally asked for. We said we would like Diffion and like key exchange algorithms. And the response we got back from the, the community was there are not good quantum resistant Diffie-Hellman like algorithm. Um, so we changed the requirements up and instead used uh, chems instead, which you can get pretty much the same functionality with. So we, we don't anticipate any additional um, competition or on ramp type thing for, for chems or Diffie Hellman like algorithms. Uh, we think you'll be able to get the functionality you need with, uh, with Kyber. So. Okay. Any other questions from the room? You didn't ask me to go back to a slide that I went too fast over. We have the final. Oh, take this one out. For Dustin, do you anticipate um, any divergence in global regions around the PQC standards, like from NC or BSI or anyone else? Yeah, so there's going to be several talks, like from BSI and from ANSI, that we'll hear from. Um, some of them have already published their guidance and, and reports. Uh, from what I can see, it looks like what is coming out of the NIST process, the algorithms we selected, are, are going to be used pretty widely. Like BSI and ANSI will talk about theirs, but they're going to use some of these same algorithms. Um, they might have slightly different, like BSI is interested in classically or Frodo. Uh, those were algorithms that were in our process, considered secure. We still might standardize class and police. Um, so, yeah, there, there will be regions that do their own. China had their own international, or not international, kind of their own <coughs> national process where they selected their own algorithms. Uh, Russia's doing their own development. But Europe and a lot of the other Asian countries, I think, will adopt probably the same algorithms that are, were in the process. Okay, well, thank you.
In today's complex, fast-paced world, you need a partner who can help secure your digital transformation so you can drive your business forward confidently. Someone who can fine-tune and integrate the secure technologies that enable mobile identities, digital payments, and a hybrid workforce. You need a partner who will have your back so you can stay focused on the road ahead and accelerate your organization's growth. Entrust, securing a world in motion.